everyone. We'll just be getting started in a couple minutes. We'll finish coming in to the webinar. Good evening, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to Geography of Hope. My name is Hilary Stamper, and I'm the Director of Member Engagement here at Alaska Wilderness Lake. I'm calling in tonight from Half Moon Bay, California, which are the traditional lands of the Ohlone people. I'm so thrilled to see so many of you have joined us for tonight's event featuring themes and stories from author and former reporter Molly Reddick's new book, Finding True North. In her book, she takes readers on a journey back in time to show what Alaska was like before the gold rush and then retraces resource booms that reshaped the state. In this Geography of Hope episode, Molly will be joined by Gwich'in elder Julie Mailer, who was born and raised in Fort Yukon. Julie and her late husband, Jean, homesteaded along the Salmon Fork of the Black River, hunting, trapping, and living off the land. Julie works with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Council of Athabascan Tribal Governments to organize camps for children across Alaska teaching traditional skills. She's been an active defender of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and other traditional subsistence lands. So with that, a few quick housekeeping items. As you can see, all participants will be muted for the program to help ensure that everyone has a good listening experience. And we've allowed for plenty of time to field questions from the audience during a Q&A section at the end. So please type in any questions that you might have. And if we can't answer them during the right away, then we'll answer them during the Q&A portion. Uh, if for any reason you missed tonight's program, we will be recording it. So you can listen to it with the link we provide tomorrow. And with that, I'm really happy to introduce Molly, who's going to share with us some images and themes from her book. Thank you so much, Hillary. Thank you to the Alaska Wilderness League for having me on this Geography of Hope episode. Um, I'm calling in from Fairbanks on the traditional lands of the first Alaskans of the Lower Tanana River. Um, thank you so much, Julie, for joining me. <laughs> I promise I'll stop bugging you after this to do events. Um, I'm just really, uh, really honored to be here and uh, to speak with you all. I was going to give a short overview with some slides and images, um, kind of a introduction to my book and why I decided to write it and um, introduce the main characters and then have a conversation with Julie about um, Alaska wilderness. So with that, I'm going to share my slides here. Okay. Let me get this in slideshow mode. All right. So my story kind of starts, my Alaska story starts in 2010 when I moved to Fairbanks um, to work at the newspaper. And I was an idealistic young person. I was a, a proud environmentalist. And to give you an example, I was finishing up my master's degree in environmental journalism at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And um, I had also grown up in a very environmentally conscious household in uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania. We lived in, in a, a really old farmhouse in the country. Um, my parents loved nature, loved wildlife. 
uh, loved loved the outdoors and really taught us to to love those things too. So I came to Alaska with these dreams of living in the wilderness, and I really wanted to write about climate change and environmental issues. And I really pictured myself, you know, trekking around on the sea ice and, and doing all those things, um, which I did get to do. But I also spent a lot of time covering uh, oil and gas stories as well, and writing about oil taxes and covering um, mining and um, stories about roads to open up new mineral, new mineral areas. And so um, it was really a wake up call to, you know, living in a, in a, in a resource economy and writing about these issues that really affected Alaskans and their jobs and livelihoods. So one of my favorite parts about that job was interviewing elders. I could not get enough of it. Um, they would tell me these stories and just transport me to, you know, a different time and place. And it just really captured my imagination. And so after a year, I, uh, I switched to a new job um, where I'm still working at the Cold Climate Housing Research Center. And I was really lucky because um, I got to travel all over Alaska um, from the Arctic coast to the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta and Southeast Alaska interior and the Yukon. It was amazing. And so I got to keep interviewing elders. And, um, and the more of these interviews that I did over the years, the more I, I realized that Alaska's history kind of fell into these four main eras. And you could certainly um, uh, add um, fur trapping to this list and fisheries, but um, my story, these really seemed like the, the turning points in Alaska's history. So um, I thought, wouldn't this be cool to, to structure a story around? So the gold rush at the turn of the 20th century was kind of the beginning of modern day Alaska, all these outsiders, coming north and building, you know, towns and infrastructure and totally alter altering the landscape. Um, then you had the airplane age right after World War II, which again, like doubled the population of Alaska because of the military presence here. And it also introduced all these small aircraft that suddenly were connecting these rural communities, nomadic communities, they were able to open up so much country to trapping and mining, um, and they just changed life forever in all over Alaska. Like suddenly people could, could get mail and manufactured goods and anything they wanted. Um, the next big boom was of course the oil pipeline in the 1970s. And this was really the, the beginning of the modern oil era we live in today where it's you know far and away the the biggest industry and the biggest part of our economy today. Um, and then subsistence is, is not so much a chapter as just a constant in Alaska. It's always been here, it always will be here. Um, and it's really an economy in and of itself. So this was definitely gonna be a big part of the story. A quick introduction to my character. So, I got kind of lucky with Clutch and I ran into him at the neighborhood saloon. Um, he happened to live uh, just across the hill from me and um, he was playing the wash tub bass at the Golden Eagle. And he was telling me he was a third generation gold miner and his parents, or I'm sorry, his grandparents had come up the Valdez Trail by horse and sleigh back in 1908. And then his, his parents carried on the mining tradition and they, um, blasted a tunnel right into the side of the, the house. And I was like, excuse me, did you say a tunnel inside the house? And he's like, oh yeah, it's, it's right, right next to the living room. And I didn't quite believe him until I toured it for myself. And this is Clutch standing at the mouth of his tunnel, which is an 800 foot drift mine that begins from the Arctic entryway of his house and just stabs into the hill. And um, they, his family spent decades um, doing hard rock mining in this tunnel. So a great example, I mean, he's had so much history in Alaska and his people and family had always relied on mining for their jobs and their and their livelihood. So um, great to get his perspective on, on resource development. I also got lucky with bush pilots. There's so many amazing bush pilots in Alaska. I've met a bunch of them, but I couldn't, couldn't, 
do any better than Al Wright. Um, he just turned 97. And so he is a uh, Athabascan, um, grew up on the Tanana River, um, bouncing around all these, these little villages. His dad was Athabascan and his mom was a white mission nurse. And um, when he was born, this nurse had to travel 200 miles by dog sled to help out with the delivery. Um, but Al, yeah, so Al really grew up remote. And then um, when he was six years old, he saw this first airplane, first airplane that he remembered. And he thought, that's what I want to do. That's my dream. But he never thought it would happen because how would this native kid um, in the middle of nowhere ever learn how to fly? But then World War II came along and he got drafted. He was 19 years old. He, uh, he managed to survive and made it back to Fairbanks and um, used the GI Bill to take flying lessons. And so Al basically, I think he had about six hours of flying lessons before he bought his first airplane, a little Taylor craft, and then just taught himself the rest of the way. And you can imagine how how that went and how many colorful stories he has from basically being on the, the very leading edge of aviation in Alaska. Um, as he says, he's, he's on his ninth life. And for oil, I found an archeologist. So thousands of people, tens of thousands of people came to Alaska for, to help build the oil pipeline um, and get that up and running in the seventies. One of them was Mike Kunz, who was an archaeologist. And I thought this was cool because I hadn't heard much from that perspective. There's lots of stories about the pipe fitters and the um, you know, laborers. And, and I hadn't really heard about an archaeologist working on the pipeline. But his job was to go ahead of the construction workers and survey the lands. They had a route picked up. It was 800 miles you know, across the entire face of Alaska. Um, from the Arctic Ocean, basically down to Valdez, down to the Pacific. And, um, and so for most of the Northern route, Mike and his small team of archeologists went ahead of the, the pipeline construction crew and made sure that they weren't basically gonna go over some important heritage site. So like a, an old village or a bunch of hearths or a grave or something like that. So they did, they have this amazing cultural assessment that they did because of the pipeline. Um, he was a great example of somebody, he just moved to Alaska because it was his dream to live in the woods and trap and trap and hunt and, um, and just tramp around the tundra. But he ended up working for 50 years in the oil industry because that's where the opportunities were. <laughs> All right, and that brings us to Julie Mailer, who is with us today. Um, and I actually met Julie at this uh, youth science camp in Arctic Village. And like I said, I've been nagging her ever since to <laughs> tell me more stories and do things like this. But um, she just, I just couldn't believe my, my central Pennsylvania imagination couldn't believe that somebody like Julie is real and is still just like the embodiment of so many of, of these ideals of living subsistence and um, you know harvesting the resources, but, but taking care of them and, and teaching the next generation how to do it. And so, yeah, so I think with that, I will bring Julie on and um, we, can, we can have a chat and then we'd love to take questions from everyone. That's me. Hi. <laughs> okay, you're still there. <laughs> yeah. So you were telling me that you're you're calling in from Fort Yukon and the Yukon River is this is an exciting time of year if you're not in Alaska that we call breakup because all of the ice from all winter is is going out. So what's it like in Fort Yukon right now, Julie? Well, there's no snow and the water's rising and it's about 30 miles upriver. It's flowing ice down, down river is flowing 30 miles, but there's jam on both, both ends, but it'll break up eventually as long as it uh, don't stay jammed. <laughs> Is there anything you can do about a jam? And can you also kind of describe like what the, 
what oh, the ice shows look like. It's not a not a peaceful process of watching the ice go out. No, it's huge. Some of them can get uh, 20 feet thick, you know, big chunks of ice. Do they no, come up on ago, shore and cause problems? Yeah, it pushes a lot of, it erodes a lot of the riverbank down here. Pushes, push, push a lot of ground down. And you're right on the river, aren't you? Your cabin? Yes, I live. Yes, I live right next to the river. So that's ex that's exciting. <laughs> oh man! Well, good luck. Um, good luck with breakup, and I hope it goes smoothly. I know all the villages along the Yukon and uh, probably Kaskokwim and some others are holding their breath right now. Yep. Um, I have so many things I want to ask you, but um, let me. Okay, I thought I'd start with this because these are some of the places we'll talk about. So you can see Fort Yukon on the map there at a big bend and then Chalkitsik where Julie's mom grew up and then the Salmon Fork Black River. Um, could you just tell us about what this country is like, you know, kind of this region, but especially the Salmon Fork Black River where you've lived for so many years? It's, it's, well, the further up you go from Fort Yukon, the trees get bigger. They get huge on the Salmon Fork. They're huge, huge logs up there. And they, and it's just wilderness. It's all it is, all wilderness. And uh, there's no road there. It's good, good, good hunting grounds. How did you even find this? this location, I know that you had kind of homesteaded in a few different places, but what was it about the Salmon Fork Black River that you liked? Well, we, well, see, we, I moved, I was about 20 years old. I moved to uh, the Shinjek first for 10 years. And uh, somebody had filed an allotment there. So we had to leave. So we went further where nobody, you know, Nobody don't bother you. <laughs> was it pretty it was good? Far for them. Yeah. Yeah, you're almost in Canada there, it looks like. Uh-huh. As far nice as nice hills this, up there. As far big as hills caribou, up there. Oh yeah, I can see. Mm-hmm. And the the caribou, they they used to migrate through where I'm at come down and then go up towards Arctic, that area. Well, they don't come down that way anymore. I think it's due to a lot of forest fire, probably burnt up all their food. And this is the porcupine herd you're talking about, which a lot of people have probably heard of just in relation to the Arctic refuge. Um, the, the porcupine herd is this, this great big herd that calves on near the, they're in the refuge near the area where they've been trying to drill forever. Um, and so, yes. so their migration has, has, has already been affected quite a bit over the years. Yeah, that's. What other type of, of resources um, do you have in that area? I know you're, you're a big trapper. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's our big, that's our income when we lived up there. That's our income trapping. Fur prices went down so low now, you know, it's, and then there's, um, there's, there's moose, there's fish up there, you know, there's berries, and then there's all the plants that's up there. But I, I did grow a big garden up there also. How much of your diet would you say came from subsistence, Julie, versus like what you probably came into Fairbanks once a year to, to go to the store and get some beans? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. And we grew wheat up there just to make flour to see if we could do it. We did that, which wow. worked. We didn't buy too much from the store. We didn't have to buy, you know, uh, meat anyway. It was all in our backyard. So you were really living off the land, like the true definition of subsistence. Yeah. Yes. 
what was it like raising kids as somebody with two little kids where I have like a million toys in the house and I feel like I need, you know, iPads and you know, all this stuff. Like, what was it like just raising kids on the land? Oh, they like the sticks. They like sticks, fishing, just being near the water in the water. You know, we had animals and, uh, you know, they took care of the animals. They never, you know, they never, the first time they ever came to town, they didn't know what a TV was. <laughs> wow. That's good parenting. Congratulations. <laughs> um, and then can you tell me about your trap line, just kind of where, where it went and then what it was like? I imagine you had to take your kids out on the trap line with you because you didn't have a babysitter, so. Yes. Yeah, we did. Okay, so we separated. My husband would take a couple of them and I take the others, you know. He wouldn't take the little ones. <laughs> so, so I take the little ones and he'd go one way. He'd be gone for about five days, you know. And and the ones I do from home, we do it minus a day, day run. Every day there's like three, three runs, maybe 20 miles, you know, one day and I go the other 20 miles the next day. So that, because I had the little ones and I had to, you know, can't keep them out all day. Yeah. Did you just throw, so, and, and you were traveling by dog team, right? So you had them yes. in your sled? Yes. Yes, it did. I think they all raised up in the sled. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, they must, uh, they didn't fall out or anything. You just. <laughs> <laughs> Nope. <laughs> one time a team, my team got away from me. And my young one is in there. He's probably about what a year old. He was in there and the team got away from me. And I started running and running, thinking they're gonna turn around. Nope, they were headed down river. I ran and ran and ran. I guess Gene realized. I didn't come back for a long time. He said, boy, I wonder where she went. So what he did, he had to he come after me. Well, I had my coat off, my hat, my scarf, because my mittens, because I had to run to catch up, hoping, hoping the sled don't tip over. Oh, yeah, he, and he never did terrifying. fall out. I know, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, you know, kind of scary at first. <laughs> How many dogs did you have? Oh, we had 10. Wow. Yeah. So he, he'd take his six and I'd take the other four. We were talking the other day about um, the horses too, because actually, sorry, I have some pictures. Let me uh, advance these slides. Um, okay, so this is the cabin on the Salmon Fork, the new one. Yeah. And these are yes, it is harvested and logs that you just did. You just did you yep. even have a chainsaw? <laughs> yeah, we 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 had to get a chainsaw. It, the first one we did, we we did a pretty good job on that small cabin. But this one here, we had a chainsaw, and we made everything. So with the fur money, we bought a uh uh what do they call sawmill? Wow, you know it's just a it's a piece of I don't know, little rail. You put it on that log and you just saw along the side there. We made all the floorboards, the roofing, the chairs, wow. tables, everything in there. You must have hauled in the windows. Yes, yeah. Very carefully. <laughs> okay, so, and then here's a couple more. Can you tell us about these photos? Okay, and that's my daughter that's with me there. That's on Easter day there. Her name is Sunny. So cute. And that's, that's the cabin we stayed in at Fort Yukon before we moved out to uh, Salmon because we lived at uh, Shinjik then. And the other one is my husband and I there. 
You look really happy being dirty. <laughs> He's a hardworking man. He was. You can uh, tell. You can tell. You guys look really happy. Okay. Okay. So how do you get the horse? How do you get the horse hundreds of miles up into the Arctic wilderness? Okay. We started. Well, we bought it from some guy in Canada. And picked it up, we drove it, you, you won't believe this, it had a filly, and we had this van, and the filly is in the van with us, with the kids and I, and uh, in the van, and, and they were working on the Alaska Highway, so we had to stop, and there's those um, people that work on the road to stop you, they said, oh, we've seen it all now, I seen cats, dogs, and everything else in a car, but not a horse. <laughs> so yeah, and then we took it to the end of the road, Circle City. We took the horse there, and from there, we um, swam across the river, the Yukon. We swam across the Yukon, and uh, we just took a. I had a compass, and I did a compass heading to our place. The, the river's pretty wide there. I've been to Circle and it's, I mean, it's yeah. not as wide as it is where the Hall Road is, but yeah, that's not a short little no, swim. No, it, it isn't, yeah. It's, it's wide and swift and deep. <laughs> you all swam, you weren't paddling. No, the horses had to swim across. There's no way we could haul them over there. But you guys had a boat. Yeah, we okay. yeah we we went over there, you know, and waited for the horse to swim across to us. Oh my gosh! And then yeah. even once you got on the other side, I imagine the travel was like, were you just following the river? And what was the walking like? No, there was we crossed a bunch of rivers like Squirrel Creek, Black River, Grayling. Those are the those are the ones I swam across. Or my husband rode the horses. <laughs> so was it worth it to have the horses up there for all that effort that it took? Yes, it's, they're a lot of work, but they're good to have. You know, we can ride up in the mountains with them and, you know, just ride. Yeah, just, just have fun, go hunting with them. Yeah, that would be great. Any kind of pack animal would be a big a big lifesaver. Hey, you see behind there, that's the meadow. That's the one we cut uh, the hay for the, the horses there. Oh, how did you get the hay up there? You grew the it, hay. It grew. No, it just grew there. And then oh, we wow. tilled up some ground to grow some, uh, some uh, wheat for them too. Oats, oats is what it was. Yeah, we grew some oats in we didn't know if it was gonna grow there. So um, we tried it and it took. Wow. I, you know, I've heard a lot of Alaska native people say that we're hunters and gatherers, we're not farmers, but you had to do both to- Yeah. Uh -huh. Did you, how yeah. did you learn the farming? Was it more from your husband or was it just stuff that yes. you figured out? Okay. Yes. More from him. Well, we learned together as we went along. What were so some of the meadow hardest now, moments? Yeah, the meadow now, you see how it's clear. Right now there's willows. I was there last fall. The willows are growing big in there. Well, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and then we can just, hopefully this doesn't cause any problems. Now maybe our, our heads are a little bit bigger. Um, <laughs> that's kind of a nice, a nice segue because I was going to ask about what, what type of environmental changes you've seen with climate change because you know Alaska is yeah, changing mm -hmm. in, so, yeah. in so many different ways. What have you seen in your region? Okay, the weather, like you said, the weather, well, fall, fall hunt now is even later because it don't freeze up like it should when it's supposed to. And spring breakup is the same. So, um, and 
the vegetation is changing, it's growing. The willows had, had grown a lot. I mean, they grew because when we first moved up there, the willows were probably in the only knee high. Now it's like that picture behind you. Wow. And that's how big they get, yes. Yep, and there's different kind of vegetation growing I haven't seen. You know, I think it's due to the change of the weather and the fire. Fire destroys a lot and it just, it, you know, it. the permafrost, there's hardly any permafrost. Yeah. Um, is, is, I would think having that uh, more vegetation on the tundra where it used to be open would also affect the migrations of, of different animals, especially caribou. They're not going to try to jump yeah. over the, try to, try to battle through the willows. So they're just going to yep. go a different direction. Stay a different direction. Yes. And the, you know, the animals that's up there in the hills, when we go trapping, you know, the ones, you know, Martin, there's a lot of Martin up there and a Wolverine, you know, moose and fish do go up and spawn up in there. Has, has it has it been beneficial in any ways, um, you know, just general warming trends um, as far as like better fishing or, or more of a certain kind of fur bear that you that you see? Um, or mostly negative. It's, it's yeah, yeah, it's it's been falling, you know, not as good as it was. That's tough. Yeah, especially when, you know, you're relying on that for everything. And, and oh, we've heard a lot about fishing, like especially the, the Chinook, the, the run of kings on the Yukon seems to have really crashed in recent years. I was wondering what impacts you've seen to the fishing. Oh, yeah. I'm hungry for fish right now. <laughs> so what brings you hope, okay? That brings me hope for more fish to replenish itself. Hopefully, because we can't fish. We can fish for other other species like um, white fish and uh, she fish, but salmon is salmon is really good. You know, it's greasy. That's what keeps us alive. <laughs> keeps you warm. Yeah, when it's fifty below. <laughs> um, what you've been there long enough. You've seen different mining operations and and other resource extraction operations all over the place what what are the impacts that you've seen from that well there's you know the animals that when they try to mine the animals move from there you know and then the water the water gets dirty you know and you, you it's not drinkable so you know it contaminates a lot of the ground I think it does yeah I think for some some of us it's more of an abstract concept where you're not seeing it every single day in your in your food um but certainly not yeah. for for people that live your kind of lifestyle yeah let's see um <laughs> Oh, I did. I still have like so many questions, but um, we probably don't have a ton more time. Um, I did want to ask you about your work with with youth, and I know that I've seen you. See, I've hung out with you at a couple of these culture camps. Can you tell the group about your culture camps, what you're trying to accomplish, and kind of the changes you've seen in in kids since you've been doing them? Okay, so. The culture camps I usually have in the summertime and probably fall time. So uh, what what I do is I I bring other people to help teach what they know also. So I teach uh, respect is what it is, you know, respect the land, you know, and the people, you know, respect it. So that way they know the country too, you know, they. Right now, the kids here, they're just stuck in their house with um, 
um, these devices. So, so, and those kids, I and then the kids that come out there is from all over the villages and maybe Fairbanks. Some there's a few that came from Fairbanks before, and uh, so what we do is we, um, I don't know, we we have fun. <laughs> We have fun. They, I teach them how to cook outside on a fire campfire. And then uh, we teach them how to fish, set a fish net. And then we teach them how to build, uh, build things. And then, oh, I don't know, we do a lot of fun things. To me, it's all fun. The kids think it is too. <laughs> we go was, swimming. Yeah. I was remembering being on the Porcupine River with you and it was like the most jam packed day. It was like, check the fish net in the morning and then you come back and you cut the fish and dry the fish. And then you started tanning these muskrat skins that you had also taken the kids muskratting in the spring. So you had these, these yeah. skins that you taught them how to tan and then, and then you go for a swim and then you're like cutting wood and then you're like, um doing so, a stick pull or like a fun game and hauling water I mean it's just it's it's fun but it's so much work yeah yeah and we have you know Quichin language time story hours so the kids learn to learn little words you know from from that teaching and they remember that how have you seen them change do you have like a certain kid that's the like an all-star <laughs> they're all good kids you know and some of them they come shy and you know shy but then once they all get together they open up they open up and, you know they i i want to say they don't believe in me but they trust me i should say they trust me you know so if anything they come to me and tell me this you know you know like that so, and we work everything out, everything goes good. So um, it's, it's um, and it's like that in the winter time too, when we have winter camp, it's different than they, they got to learn how to dress properly because we'll be outside all day. I think it's that they're inspired by you. And I can definitely relate to that because that's why, um, you know, I've been yeah. hounding you for, <laughs> about all this. <laughs> it's just, there's not a lot of people that are like, that are walking the walk when it comes to subsistence. It's something we hear about in Alaska and we incorporate it into our lives in different ways. So like my family will go dip netting for salmon in the summer and we, we pick berries and we hunt, but it's a very small portion of our overall diet. So to see somebody still doing it like you have these options, you have a lot of easier options that most of us have embraced and you have opted to do things the hard way. Why do you think you have done that? It's not hard, it's fun because uh, I liked it. It was right there in your backyard. All, all you need is there, you know? Uh, so it, you know, we, we didn't make much you know on our fur but we got what we needed with the money that we made off the fur so yeah we pick berries and we we make our jelly you know it, it was fun it's not it's a lot of work a lot of work but it's fun work you know if you like to work that's you know that's that's why i was out there that's why i went out there I hear you. And now that you're in Fort Yukon, which is still by most standards, extremely rural, what do you miss about your cabin being out way out? Uh, well, I'm going there pretty quick as soon as the ice go. <laughs> so yeah, I miss the quietness, you know, just the nature itself out there, you know, the, the animals, you know, the birds and, you know, the trees, you know, there's trees here too, animals here, but there's a lot of noise behind it. <laughs> yeah, I've never, I've never seen so much uh, wolverine caught here in Fort Yukon this winter. They were around town. Wow, and that's that's rare. We never hardly ever see them around here. Do they raid 
people's freezers or caches or no no they just um you know traveling through traveling through town you know and people see their tracks see them they go out and set traps for them yeah i think there was about i don't know must have been about 20 of them wow that is a lot yeah yeah hillary do we have time for one more story okay um one of the ones that i wrote about in my book and, and it's so hard to it was so hard to choose like a story because you have to leave out most of them but um the one about lewis shooting himself in the leg with the squirrel gun which is like every mother's nightmare but like can you tell us that story about just what happened and how you how hard you had to work to get him to the doctor okay well <clears throat> my husband already left water is springtime ice went it's this time of the year and he he took off i'm gonna go get supplies so he took off and there was just earl lewis and uh tanisha there and i the last two babies you know that left there well they weren't babies well i was inside the cabin and pretty soon he come hopping in the house ah oh, ah oh, he said i said what's going on i i think i don't know he said ah uh, he didn't want to tell me but i told him what happened ah oh, that i was cleaning the gun and it it shot me in the leg he said i said oh my gosh so i pull his rubber boot off and i cut this pant leg and i seen it i said oh my gosh i said okay so we had animals so me and tonisha had to get feed all the animals because we're going to be gone it's going to take us three days to float down to the village three days in wow. a canoe and the water was high and he's never you know um paddled been the guard on uh in the back so i told him you have to tell me i have you know i have to tell you which way to turn because this water is pouring out of their high water and yeah we paddled all the way down took us three days and then got to chalkitsik and uh we waited we had to wait till the next day to catch a flight over Jeez. to uh to Fairbanks. Well, we got to Fairbanks and I called, I tried to send a message to my husband on his way. We beat him to Fairbanks. <laughs> we, we beat him to Fairbanks because he had to go from up there to Fort Yukon all the way to a circle and then drive over the highway. Oh. <laughs> and uh yeah, and and it lodged in his ankle, but we had it taken out. So yeah. Wow. That That's... was yeah. That that was the the gunshot didn't scare me. It was the water. It was so high, just rushing, you know. It's so high, and, and you're in a canoe with two kids, never paddled in the high water before. So, and wow. they just had to listen. I said, well, if we tip over, just um, keep your head up and I'll find you later. I just tell them. <laughs> You're just kind of praying the whole time that you don't run into a sweeper yes. or. Yes. Oh, wow. That's, that's really crazy. <laughs> um, that story just, yeah, it's, it's, it captures the, it's, another element of subsistence where something happens you have to learn how to deal with it you must have had so many like home remedies and and little yeah tricks for staying well yep like a toothache you get a plier and moose hide and pull it out oh. <laughs> no uh no no novocaine uh -oh. Um, what were some of the things from that you had learned from your mom or your elders that really came in handy living out there? Uh, tannin moose hide and picking herbs. You know, that that's that was, you know, that stuck with me forever. That's going to stay with me. So I was supposed to uh, start tanning a moose hide here, but it got too late. The lady just she said she just got rid of it. I was going to teach her how to tan a moose hide also. 
but she I broke remember, her wrist. <laughs> I remember seeing somebody doing that in Arctic Village when I met you up there and it was like, yeah, it was so much work. And that thing was so heavy, just trying to drag it, you know, to mm -hmm. hang it, to be able to. Yes. Yeah. It is, they're heavy. Did you always tan all your moose hides? Most of them I have. Wow. Yeah. And it, it's a lot of work. I don't have no kids to help me now. So <laughs> they're all grown Grandkids. and gone. They're the ones that help me a lot. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to adopt a lot of kids to go out in the woods with me and stay up there. And then we could do, I could teach them at the same time. Yeah. I'm going to send, how old do they have to be? I'll send Hazel. She's four. Okay. Oh, they're, they're, as long as they, they can speak, they're good. Okay. Yeah, she's a real hard worker. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is so awesome. Let's take some questions now, Julie. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. So thank you guys so much for um, this conversation. It's just so fascinating to hear about living in Alaska in this completely self-sufficient way. Um, we will definitely share links in our email tomorrow and um, you can buy Molly's book via a link that we'll share in the chat in a few minutes and we'll also email it out tomorrow. Um, before we start with Q&A, just really quickly, um, I wanted to give everyone a chance to contribute and help keep special places in Alaska wild like those that we discussed tonight. As you know, Alaska Wilderness League works on all kinds of issues um, to protect lands that are important for subsistence as well as for all kinds of wildlife um, from the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska where there are all kinds of um, creatures like caribou, migratory birds like snowy owls and tundra swans and as far south as the Tongass National Forest. So if you can help us out by supporting this work, you can go to alaskawild.org slash donate today. And we would be so appreciative um, of your efforts to support Keeping Alaska Wild. And of course, we're already appreciative of your participation in this event tonight. Uh, so with that, I would love to introduce our manager of Alaska campaigns to lead the Q&A, Maddie Halloran. Um, she is a really important part of our Alaska team and an avid reader and um, is going to be helping out with the Q&A. Um, yep, Maddie Halloran. I'm the manager of Alaska Campaigns. I'm currently on Denial Lands in Anchorage, Alaska, where I was born and raised. And I'm so happy we could have both of you join us today. Um, I just, I loved this book as someone who grew up in Alaska and felt like I really identified with um, not only, you know, some of the crazy stories that happen when you're out and about in Alaska, but also um a lot of the reflections on on booms and busts in Alaska's history so I really appreciated both of your stories um we had a bunch of questions come through in the chat that I was writing down um so Julie people have a bunch of questions about your um where you were living on Salmon Fork um someone asked how, how bad are the mosquitoes Hey, years ago when I was a kid, there was a guy, he uh, used to live up there. He's no longer with us, but uh, he burnt the country to kill the mosquitoes. But the mosquitoes are, you know, you eat the right food. They, it, for me, it seemed like you eat certain foods out there. It don't bother you as much. They're, they're buggy, but, you know, they don't bite you or anything. They just buzz around you. You're going to have to send us a list of those foods. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. And how long was your growing season on this, the salmon fork? And, and how did you coordinate like getting your supplies or um, communicating with people outside of there? We don't communicate. The only time we communicate it is when after breakup, he goes down and get all the news. I put a little mailbox out there by my house up there and few people come up hunting. It goes, who delivers mail this far? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and yeah, that's the only time we communicate. And we listen to uh, KJNP radio station. 
they send messages through that, but we can't, you know, they just send us message. We don't, you, we don't communicate. So it, it oh, was and like, um, what was the, uh, the growing season? When did you do your, your planting and the harvesting? growing season for, for, uh, the food the garden, we, I, we built our own little, uh, like on the side of the cabin where the sun hit for tomatoes. We grew there, grew tomatoes there, like in a little greenhouse. And we have a big, we, we, the growing season is good for root crops. We grew like um, root, rutabagas, turnips, uh, cabbage, carrots, broccoli, cauliflower, green beans, uh, a lot, a lot of that, you know, and the green stuff. We tried corn. It's just too short a season for corn. So yeah, it, it's good. The the three months we, we started at the full moon. Pretty, we start in the full moon for certain uh, plants that'll grow. We start there, and it takes uh, June, July, August, September. We harvest. Pretty long. Um, so we, you talked about a few environmental changes like with fishing and, and the willows that you noticed. Someone asked about permafrost. Have you noticed anything um, else in the, in the land changing as, as climate change and different temperatures? Um, but specifically, they were asking about permafrost melting, but any other environmental changes? Well, that's, well, that's, and we see the permafrost, you know, there's places and the glacier, the ice that was up there where we go in the summer just to get ice. <laughs> oh, so there's a glacier there is no longer there. So it, you know, everything just kind of like, what happened? Somebody turned the heat on, you know, and, and then the growth, I, and a lot of the land is drying up. A lot of the lakes are kind of dry. Wow, yeah. Um, okay, and sorry, I, I wrote these down a little out of order with what you were talking about, but there was a question, um, what do you do with the fur? So you talked about selling furs. Okay, keep, okay. Like, the moose the, hide. Yeah. Okay, so the moose hide and the fur, well, see, there's no store up there, so I have to make clothing for my kids. And you know, the moose hide, we use it for like mittens and our boots. That's what the moose hide where it come in and the furs with, you know, your coat, they're warm. And uh, yeah, it, it, it holds its purpose. And then the ones that are good, we sell them so we could get good price from it because that's, you know, that's our only income. Thank you. Um, Molly, there was a question back when you were introducing sort of the concept behind the book, um, asking how you chose to write about those specific pieces of history. And um, there was a specific question about why you didn't write about some things in Alaska's mm. history and occupation. And I guess there's a lot in Alaska's history. I don't think- yeah. Like you to write about everything, but you wanted to talk a little bit more about why you chose those. Boom. Yeah, that's a really good question because it's hard to justify. Like, how, you could start in the late 1700s and write about the Russian trappers and traders that came and exploited, you know, first Alaskan hunters and um, almost decimated the seal and the otter populations. And um, I think I was just modern history has to start somewhere and it was like the gold rush seemed like the closest thing to the beginning of like modern history in terms of like there's frontier cities and infrastructure and roads and you know and it kind of built from there and then the other big reason also there's some really good books about um the the fur era as well I would say and then the last thing was I really wanted to do everything from firsthand stories and from like from living elders who could you know trace back their their lineage and like talk about life before and after each of these booms and it was just so much easier for me to 
to find gold miners. Whereas trying to track down, you know, you start going deeper into history, it gets a lot harder to track down those storytellers. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, we just have a few minutes left and I think normally we end our geography of hope by asking our guests what um, currently brings them hope. So I wonder if either of you have any reflections on that from your experiences in Alaska. You first, Julie. Huh? <laughs> David, say that again. What brings you hope? Oh, I told you. What brings me hope? To be able to fish and hunt and, you know, just um, that this land don't change too much. <laughs> I would so say, I could, you know. I would say groups like Alaska Wilderness League and the fact that all these people are interested in this subject. And, and then for me personally, writing this book was just so like, it took like forever, seven plus years to, from doing the interviews and then deciding like what the heck to write about and then edits and publishing. And, um, but yeah, meeting people like Al, Clutch, Mike and Julie, and especially people like Al and Clutch who, um, I really disagree with politically, but they're like, they're very dear friends now and we can talk about anything. So I think in this, the past eight years while I was writing this were really hard, like for a lot of people, but just um, socially and politically crazy things were happening in the country. So, and, and it felt like our society was getting so divided. So to be able to kind of reach across the divide and and like have these really good friends and people like Clutch and Al that I could like really disagree with but still have a civil conversation with and um yeah that that gives me hope because I think that's our our way forward great thank you well I will uh toss it back over to Hillary for any final thoughts yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, there were still more questions in the Q&A, but just to try to close up on time for people, um, we'll follow up with a couple more questions of Molly and Julie um, and try to answer them via email. So thank you all so much for coming tonight. And I just wanted to close with two sentences from um, a part of um, the book that just spoke to me about Alaska. It, there's a section where she was talking about a little girl who um, Julie helped accomplish this big task that she didn't think she could do. And it said, this is what culture camp was all about. And for that matter, life too. Learning skills, testing your limits, and seeing if you can push a little further. Maybe that's the appeal, appeal of Alaska. It reminds us constantly that we are only human while giving us occasional glimpses of the divine. And I really feel like that's true of Alaska and Alaska Wilderness League. Thanks you guys so much for helping us preserve that element. So have a great night, everyone, and we will email you. you tomorrow. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much. <laughs>